This is a presentation of the Miami Design Preservation League. For more information about the Preservation League, go to the website mdpl.org. Hello, my name is Howard Brayer. I'm a volunteer walking tour guide in Miami Beach for both the Miami Design Preservation League and the Jewish Museum of Florida. For over 30 years, I was a budget analyst for the Federal Department of Education in Washington, D.C. This video is adapted from a walking tour I did for the Preservation League in 2015, the 100th anniversary of the formal incorporation of Miami Beach in 1915. Not long before that, what was to become the world's playground consisted largely of acres of swamp. This video traces the city's improbable rise and the various ups and downs that have befallen it. First, a few words about the geography as a basic understanding of it will allow you to better grasp the history. Miami Beach is located on a barrier island about nine miles long from south to north and a mile wide from east to west. The eastern boundary is the Atlantic Ocean. The western boundary is Biscayne Bay. Almost all streets running east-west are numbered consecutively, starting at 1st Street in the south to 87th Street in the north. If you know what street you're on, you have a good idea of where in the city you are. The city is generally divided into three main sections, South Beach from the southern tip to 23rd Street, Mid Beach, 23rd Street to 63rd Street, and North Beach, 63rd Street to 87th Street. The Tequesta Native American tribe were the first inhabitants of what was to become Miami Beach. At the time of Spanish colonization, they occupied an area along the southeastern Atlantic coast of Florida. They had infrequent contact with Europeans and had largely migrated away from the coast by the middle of the 18th century. The first modern development in what is now Miami Beach took place in 1870 when Henry and Charles Lum, farmers from New Jersey, established a coconut plantation on the island. In 1886, Charles Lum built the first home on Miami Beach, on what is now the 1200 block of Ocean Drive. You would think a coconut plantation would do well, but at the time there were a lot of rabbits and other small mammals on the island, and they ate the young coconut shoots. In 1894, the Lums left their failed venture, and the land came under the control of John Collins, another New Jersey farmer, who was one of the investors in the coconut plantation. Collins first came to Miami Beach in 1896, the year the railroad first arrived in the city of Miami, opening up the area for development. By 1907, Collins controlled Miami Beach, all the way from what is now 14th Street to 67th Street. By then, Collins was operating a fairly successful farming operation, growing various fruits and vegetables, particularly avocados. In 1912, he began to build the first bridge on the route where the Venetian Causeway now is from Miami across Biscayne Bay to M Miami Beach with the financial backing of two Miami bank brothers, J.E. and J.N. Lummis. In 1912, the Lummis brothers also bought land at the southern end of the island and established the first real estate company, Ocean Beach Realty. Almost immediately thereafter, John Collins turned from farming to real estate development, establishing the Miami Beach Improvement Company for land sales north of 20th Street. In 1913, Carl Fisher, a wealthy industrialist from Indiana, whose company, Presto Light, supplied headlights for nearly every car in the country at the time, entered the development scene. Fisher lent Collins $50,000 to complete his bridge, and in return, Collins gave Fisher 200 acres of land at the southern end of his holdings. Fisher established the third real estate company 
Alton Beach Realty and envision the city as a, quote, city beautiful, existing in and of itself, not as an adjunct to the established city of Miami across the bay. The Lummis brothers divided up their land into small plots for modest residences. In 1914, they sold part of their land holdings to the government for creation of a park, Lummis Park. Collins and Fisher divided up their land into larger parcels, focusing on a wealthier clientele. On March 26, 1915, the three real estate companies consolidated their efforts and passed a town charter incorporating as the town of Miami Beach. At the time, 80% of the population lived at the southern end of the island, and there were only 33 registered voters. From 1912 to 1918, the basic infrastructure was created. Much of the land was cleared by Bahamians, who faced much discrimination. Along with the rest of the segregated South, discrimination against black people continued here until the enactment of the major civil rights leg legislation of the 1960s. The first roads were installed in 1913. The first landfill completed in 1914. The first hotel, the Atlantic Beach, later Browns, opened in 1915. The building still exists as Prime 112 Restaurant at First Street and Ocean Drive. The first U.S. Census to include Miami Beach in 1920 counted 644 residents. The 1920 telephone directory shown here listed 80 numbers, including those for J.N. Lummis, John Collins, and Carl Fisher. Miami Beach's first big boom came in the early 1920s, along with the overall prosperity of the country. The primary focus was catering to the wealthy, and the city became known as a place where the rich went to play. Industrial tycoons such as Harvey Firestone of Tire fame and J.C. Penney of Department Store fame built elaborate mansions. A three-mile stretch of Collins Avenue in Mid-Beach was known as Millionaire's Row. Carl Fisher built several large, luxurious hotels, including the Flamingo pictured here, complete with golf courses and polo fields. A land boom ensued, the price of land skyrocketed. By 1925, the city had 56 hotels with a total of 4,000 rooms, 178 apartment houses, 858 private residences, four polo fields, and three golf courses. The predominant architectural style in Miami Beach from 1920 through the early 1930s was Mediterranean Revival. The style was introduced in the United States in the very late 19th century and early 20th century, incorporating references from various earlier styles including Spanish Baroque, Spanish Colonial, Italian Renaissance, Venetian Gothic, and French. The style was popularized at the Panama California Exposition of 1915 in San Diego, which celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal. The style peaked in popularity in the 1920s and 30s, especially in the seaside resorts and towns growing rapidly in that period in Florida and California. Pictured here is one of the city's most famous Mediterranean Revival buildings, Casa Causarina, built in 1930 as a residence for Alden Freeman and more commonly known today as the Versace Mansion, as it was the home of the noted Italian fashion designer Johnny Versace in the 1990s. Two events in the latter half of the 1920s changed the course of history of Miami Beach as a resort. First, in September 1926, a major hurricane made a direct hit on Miami and Miami Beach. Winds of 132 miles per hour were reported. The Miami News reported 131 people dead and 2,500 injured in the area with much property damage. The Miami Tribune noted the worst damage was in South Miami Beach, with stretches of Ocean Drive washed away and Washington Avenue in wreckage. Subsequent growth severely slowed for the rest of the decade, though the city did try to show it was still in business. For example, a grand 
City Hall was built in 1927. Then in 1929, the stock market crashed and it was the beginning of the Great Depression. Carl Fisher lost his fortune in the Depression and a portion of the wealthy who had been coming to Miami Beach and were the driving force in the growth of the city also lost all or most of their money. The 1930s were years of tremendous growth for Miami Beach. The population more than quadrupled from 6,000 to 28,000. Although difficult economic times for Miami Beach began before the stock market crash of 1929 with the hurricane of 1926 and the end of the land boom, the depression did not last as long in the Miami area as in the rest of the nation. Although the depression wiped out the fortunes of many, there were still enough people with money to stay in the city's luxury hotels and maintain homes, although there was not enough demand to build new luxury class hotels. There were also enough middle class visitors eager to get a respite from hard times to fill up the smaller, less expensive hotels. Middle class travel greatly expanded after passage of the Wagner Act of 1935, which protected the rights of workers to unionize. Its enactment increased the number of people who had time and money to vacation in South Florida. One main draw in the 1930s was the pr proliferation of gambling, both legal and illegal. Florida passed a law in 1931 legalizing racetrack betting. Hialeah Racetrack was such an immediate success that its annual racing dates from January 1st to March 15th became the unofficial tourist season. Slot machines were legalized for a brief time in 1935, but proliferated even after their banishment as the government was loath to crack down on such a lucrative enterprise. To meet the needs of a growing middle class, middle, Miami Beach experienced a building boom in the second half of the decade. Ten hotels opened in 1935, 38 in 1936. In 1935, Miami Beach ranked ninth in the nation for new construction, remarkable for a city of its relatively small size. By 1940, there were 239 hotels and 706 apartment buildings in the city. Many of the new buildings were in the popular Art Deco style, which architects such as Henry Hohauser and L. Murray Dixon adapted into a distinctly whimsical and streamlined style often called Tropical Deco. The Congress Hotel, pictured here, opened in 1936 as a typical Art Deco building in Miami Beach. Art Deco is now the type of architecture most closely associated with Miami Beach and to this day is a main attraction of the city. On the morning of December 7, 1941, Miami Beach tourist officials were anticipating a banner $175 million winter tourist season. By afternoon, thoughts turned to oil-covered beaches and total blackouts. Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and America was drawn into World War II. During the war, tourism plunged, but the U.S. Army Air Force, there was no separate Air Force at the time, took over much of Miami Beach as a training ground and staging area, and many of the hotels and apartment buildings were used to house troops. A total of 188 hotels, 109 apartment houses, and 18 private homes were requisitioned for use by officers and enlisted men. The government set up a lease program to pay the owners of the buildings. The streets, golf courses, and beaches were used to practice marching and other maneuvers. A total of 500,000 troops passed through the city and many of them were impressed with what they saw. Here are the words of a soldier named Dan Moody, written in a letter back home to Virginia. Mother, this is the most beautiful place I have ever seen. Green palm trees, green grass, blue ocean and sky, it's like a fairy tale. I think that when the war is over, I'll move down here. With veterans and other newcomers, post-war boom times were in Miami Beach's future. After the war, thousands did return, either as vacationers, residents, or eventually as retirees. 
The post-war years were highlighted by the growth of large hotels and star-studded entertainment in Mid-Beach and North Beach. Post-war population growth in Miami Beach was spurred by the three A's, Army, Airplanes, and Air Conditioning. First, Army. As mentioned previously, many of the soldiers who passed through Miami Beach during the war returned to the city afterwards. Second, Airplanes. Air travel greatly expanded after the war and made South Florida much more accessible to the rest of the nation. Number three, air conditioning. Air conditioning became much more widespread after the war and made the area much more livable year-round. The estimated number of tourist arrivals grew from 50,000 in 1935 to 2 million in 1955. After the war, most of the development was not in South Beach, as that was almost fully built up before the war, but was further north, in Mid-Beach and North Beach. The new buildings erected after the war had several important modern amenities that the buildings erected before the war lacked, the most important of which I've already mentioned, air conditioning. After the war, as living and vacationing in South Beach fell out of favor, the center of gravity of the city and its tourist industry moved further north. The buildings in South Beach started to physically deteriorate, and by the 1960s and 70s, it was a fairly run-down neighborhood with few visitors. It thus became an inexpensive area to live in, with a population of mainly retirees living on low incomes who could not afford more expensive areas. In 1980, the median age of its residents was 66. In the meantime, a lot was happening further north. The opening of the Julia Tuttle Causeway in 1959, connecting the city of Miami with 41st Street in Miami Beach, made the northern parts of the beach more accessible. There was a phenomenal boom of major glitzy hotels. For example, the Saxony Hotel at 3201 Collins Avenue, erected in 1949, cost an astonishing, for the time, $5 million to erect. Florida Architecture Magazine described it as a, quote, luxurious to the last interior detail. The owner's desire to create a hotel of lasting beauty and dignity, representing an investment of permanence, was an inspiration to the architects. And the Fontainebleau Hotel at 4441 Collins Avenue, erected in 1954 and pictured here on the site of the old Harvey Firestone estate. The Fontainebleau was the epitome of post-war luxe in Miami Beach. The hotel was at its opening and still is the largest in the city. As the newer hotels grew in size and luxury, there was a great expansion of entertainment. Most of the top stars of the era performed in Miami Beach in both hotels and nightclubs. Johnny Mathis in the Supremes at the Eden Rock. Connie Francis at the Deauville. In addition, the Beatles performed there during their first visit to America in February 1964. The performance was shown live across the country on The Ed Sullivan Show. Also, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, Tony Bennett, and Liberace at the Fontainebleau. Jackie Gleason filmed his acclaimed television show in Miami Beach from 1964 to 1970. He always began his broadcast with the words, From Miami Beach, the fun and sun capital of the world. The club chalet at the Lucerne featured a preview of the area's future, a Havana Mardi Gras featuring Diosa Costello and a full cast of Latin American entertainers. As prominent as the new hotels were, more of the new construction in Miami Beach was for high-rise apartments. Two-thirds of the buildings erected in the city between 1965 and 1975 were for this purpose. To this day, the section of Collins Avenue from 44th Street to 72nd Street is called Condo Canyon as it is hemmed in by many large condos and a smaller number of hotels. The next section of the video will veer away from the chronological order followed up to this point to spotlight two communities that have played a large role in Miami Beach, first the Jewish community and then Cubans and other Hispanics.
Pictured here is Beth Jacob, the first synagogue in Miami Beach. It is now the site of the Jewish Museum of Florida. The first Jewish family to move to Miami Beach was in its very early days of its development, 1913. It was the Weiss family, Joe and Jenny, originally immigrants from Hungary, who first settled in New York. They opened Miami Beach's oldest and likely best-known restaurant to this day, Joe's Stone Crab. In the early days of the city, Jewish people largely resided in the southernmost part of the city, the result of real estate companies refusing to sell land to Jews due to anti-Semitism. It's important to also note that Miami Beach was more liberal than many other new resorts popping up early in the 20th century, as many of them were totally closed to Jews. In the 1930s, Jewish people started to gain more influence in the city, moving into professional positions and becoming hotel developers and owners. By 1940, Jewish people comprised about 20% of the total population of Miami Beach. In 1943, the first of 17 Jewish mayors of the city, Mitchell Wolfson, was elected. After World War II, Miami Beach became very heavily Jewish. By 1950, about 50% of the city was Jewish, and the peak of the Jewish population here was in the 1960s and 70s. In that era, the entire city was about 60% Jewish. South Beach was about 80%. To put those figures in context, the Jewish population in the country at the time was only 3%. During this time, there was a thriving Yiddish culture here. Yiddish was the language of Eastern European Jews, and many of the people in Miami Beach were immigrants from Eastern Europe during the first two decades of the 20th century. There was Yiddish theater, singing groups, and discussion groups. Pictured here is a Yiddish theater on Washington Avenue later the site of the Mansion nightclub. Many people were active in politics. Most were liberal Democrats. You might ask, why were Jewish people attracted to Miami Beach? Although there was discrimination against Jewish people in the early days of the city, many of the burgeoning southern resorts at the time were totally close to Jews, thus Miami and Miami Beach were more welcoming than most other places. Jewish hotel owners, as you might expect, encouraged other Jews to stay at their hotels, but they also actively encouraged other Jews to reside here permanently. And after World War II, when the largest number of Jews moved to the city, there was a, quote, snowball effect. If you were Jewish and looking for a synagogue to belong to or access to kosher food, or if you were more comfortable among your co-religionists, Miami Beach was a place you could find those things in abundance. It all built on itself like a snowball. During the 1980s and 90s, the Jewish population of the city quickly diminished. The current Jewish population is about 15%, high by national standards, but low by Miami Beach historic standards. Two things happened to the people who were living here. One, by the 1980s and 90s, they were passing away in large numbers because of their age, and two, as the economic revitalization of the city, particularly in South Beach, progressed, there was a large increase in the cost of living, and the people could no longer afford to live here. There was some subsidized housing built, but not enough to accommodate most of the people. Next is a look at one influential Jewish person in Miami Beach history. Rose Weiss, husband Jeremiah, and their children who moved here from New York in 1919, were the second Jewish family to reside in Miami Beach. Rose came to be known as the mother of Miami Beach. Among other things, she attended every city council meeting over a period of 38 years. She designed the official flag of Miami Beach in 1950, pictured here. She was the volunteer head of the city's welfare department before it was a paid position and she raised more funds selling World War II bonds than any other woman in the state of Florida. Pictured here is Española Way, which was conceived in 1925 as the historic Spanish village, modeled after the romantic Mediterranean villages found in the south of Europe. Today it consists of restaurants, bars, art galleries, and small shops. 
The street is just a small sign of the massive impact Hispanic culture has had on the entire Miami area, including Miami Beach. Prior to 1959, there had been a small but steady trickle of emigration from Cuba to America. However, with the Cuban Revolution that year and the coming to power of Fidel Castro, the trickle turned into waves. Cuban emigration can be classified into four major waves. First, the initial exodus from 1959 to 1962, consisting primarily of upper and upper middle class families. Second, freedom flights from 1965 to 1974, which were an orderly series of departures coordinated by both the U.S. and Cuban governments. This was an exodus of primarily middle and working class people. Third, the Mario Boatlift in the spring of 1980. It was a chaotic exodus by sea from the Cuban port of Mario. It included people from all segments of society, including many poor people. As part of this, Castro included many released prisoners and people from mental institutions. Quite a few of these latter groups found a home in South Beach as it was an inexpensive place to reside. This set up a culture clash with the elderly residents and with an increase in crime and drug problems helped hasten the exodus of the elderly from South Beach. And finally, a steady stream of emigrants since the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union in 1989, including people arriving by raft and beneficiaries of a special lottery system implemented in 1994. Over time, Cubans have been joined by others, including South Americans, Central Americans, and people from Caribbean countries. As of the last census, 53% of Miami Beach residents and 65% of Miami-Dade County residents are of Latino or Hispanic origin. 38% of all businesses in Miami Beach are Hispanic-owned, as are 60% in the county. The Miami area is now considered a capital of the Latin American world. Much of the area is bilingual, with major Spanish-language newspapers, television stations, and radio stations. There are many Latin banks, and Spanish-speaking tourists can feel culturally at home here. Next is a look at three influential members of the Hispanic community. On the left is Jorge Perez. He was born in Argentina of Cuban parents and lived in Colombia before moving to Miami in 1968. In 1979, he founded the Related Companies, with New York builder Stephen Ross. Perez built his fortune by building and operating low-income multifamily apartments across Miami, then branched off into rental apartments before becoming one of the most prolific high-rise condo builders in the southern United States. In Miami Beach, his projects include the luxury condos Murano Grande, Murano at Portofino, and Portofino Tower. In 2011, Perez donated $35 million in cash and art to the Miami Art Museum to support the construction of its new building on the Biscayne Bay waterfront in Miami. The museum was renamed the Perez Art Museum Miami. Well-known Cuban-American musicians Gloria and Emilio Estefan now reside in Miami Beach. In addition to selling millions of records, they are successful entrepreneurs founding Estefan Enterprises, which is headquartered in Miami Beach. Their company is involved in entertainment production, talent management, and hotel and restaurant management. Among their holdings are Lario's on the Beach Restaurant and the Cardozo Hotel in Miami Beach. In the 1970s, Miami Beach as a whole began to face difficult times. The opening of Walt Disney World in 1971 began to shift the attention of Florida-bound tourists away from the Miami area towards Orlando. New Caribbean resorts were attracting more visitors as air travel became easier. South Beach was primarily a retirement community, and the whole city was beginning to get a reputation as a retirement community rather than as a destination resort. As tourism decreased, 
the city had no other industry to fall back on. There was a realization that as the elderly in South Beach passed away, something about the area would have to change. One idea popular among local developers and the city commission was to demolish the older buildings and replace them with new, higher density, modern developments. A totally different approach was advocated by a new organization, the Miami Design Preservation League, founded in 1976. The group was in favor of preserving the old buildings in tandem with revitalizing the neighborhood by bringing in tourists and younger residents attracted by its historic nature. Money these newcomers spent would be used to fix up the buildings. The league was first led by Barbara Capitman, who had moved to the area from New York in 1973. She and others were fascinated by the Art Deco architecture and resolved to save it. An important contributor to the league was the designer Leonard Horowitz, who in the early 1980s was put in charge of repainting the facades of the Art Deco buildings with a color palette that he devised. The resulting spruced up streetscape was meant to attract more people to back the preservation efforts. At first, the preservation ideas were not popular. The buildings in question were only 40 or 50 years old and were not thought to be historic by many people. Also, the majority thought it was better to change the blighted area and start over with new buildings. One of the first things the preservationists did was to survey all the buildings in the area to know better what they were working with. In 1979, the preservationists scored a big victory when the Miami Beach Architectural District, more popularly known as the Art Deco District, was put on the National Register of Historic Places. This official rec res recognition as a historic area was significant as it was the first neighborhood in the country of 20th century buildings to be added to the National Register. Inclusion on the register does not directly preserve the old buildings. That is done through local laws and regulations. In 1982, Miami Beach enacted its first rather weak preservation ordinance. Over time, the preservation laws were tightened making it difficult to destroy the historic nature of South Beach. In addition, as preservation became more popular and the economic revitalization of South Beach progressed, other parts of the city were designated as historic districts. Lincoln Road, pictured here, encapsulates in a microcosm the ups and downs of Miami Beach as a whole. Carl Fisher created Lincoln Road in the 1920s intending it to be the Fifth Avenue of the South. Bonwit Teller, Saks Fifth Avenue, automobile dealerships, and movie theaters made Lincoln Road the focus of commercial activity on Miami Beach through the 1940s. As the large hotels were built on Upper Collins Avenue in the 1950s, shopping moved away from Lincoln Road. In 1960, Lincoln Road merchants enlisted architect Morris Lapidus to plan a mall close to automobile traffic. Lapidus constructed a series of concrete follies and widened the sidewalks, stating a car never bought anything. This enabled the street to make a temporary comeback, but the general decline of South Beach in the late 1960s and 1970s was reflected in the empty storefronts on Lincoln Road. With the revitalization of South Beach, Lincoln Road is again a hub of Miami Beach life, mixing national chains such as Macy's and H&M with local independent stores and many restaurants. The pedestrian area now stretches east-west for eight blocks, most of the width of South Beach here. For South Beach in general, as noted earlier, there was a radical change in the population from primarily old and low income to Cubans and young people looking for a more walkable urban environment compared to most of the Miami metro area. In addition, there was an influx of gay and lesbian residents in the 1980s and 90s. As was the case in other revitalizing urban neighborhoods around the country, for example, DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., Boys Town in Chicago, and Greenwich Village in Chelsea in New York City, 
gays and lesbians have often been in the forefront of gentrification of urban areas. In particular, households of men are more willing to live in marginal neighborhoods and poor school systems are of less of a concern to those who are childless. In Miami Beach, gays and lesbians played a large role in the preservation efforts and continue to do so. The economic revitalization hoped for did occur spurred by businessmen who began investing and renovating the old properties, the arrival of artists and people involved in the fashion, film, and TV industry as South Beach became a popular place for fashion shoots and media productions, and finally celebrities who started to visit as South Beach became a hot destination. In purely economic terms, the revival of South Beach has been a success. What was a poor, deteriorating neighborhood in the 1970s is now a byword for cool. What had been one of the cheapest places to live in South Florida is now one of the most expensive, a highly desirable place to visit or reside in. When LeBron James announced he was leaving Cleveland, he didn't say he was going to Miami. He said he was going to South Beach. This is the New World Center, designed by Frank Gehry. It's home to the New World Symphony, the mission of which is to prepare graduates of distinguished music programs for leadership roles in orchestras and ensembles around the world. The center is a relatively recent addition to the high-quality arts and entertainment venues in the city. At this point, we can think of the challenges facing Miami Beach in its second century, including, in the near term, overcoming the health and economic crises caused by the coronavirus pandemic, and in the longer term, climate change, which under the worst scenarios could threaten the very existence of the city, balancing the development needs of the tourist industry versus the needs of residents who often want to slow down development, and transportation issues, balancing the need for improved roadways and parking versus mass transit development, all with limited dollars. I will not try to foolishly predict the future of Miami Beach. However, we can admire the words of Hank Meyer, a publicist for the city, who in 1964, on the eve of Miami Beach's 50th anniversary, said, By 2014, each hotel will have its own rocket launching pad. The trip from Miami Beach to New York will take 10 minutes, and the local kennel club will have racing porpoises. We might chuckle at his thoughts, but I can't admire his unlimited optimism and can-do spirit, a key trait of many of the men and women who have made the city of Miami Beach what it is today. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video, and thank you for watching.